you know, as I've been covering the Peter Singer uh, debate, uh, sorry to keep railing on this, but it was good today to preach with the authority of the scriptures. Now, I want to take you back just a little bit to try to explain why this is important. In many elements of theology and philosophy, there are areas where we can have robust conversation and debate. If you want to say, hey, listen, you know, I see the world a certain way for one reason or another, most of the time that can be a pretty broad spectrum of things to discuss. So I thought, why is it that you may be thinking, why is it, and this leads to preaching out of Romans today, why is it, and so this is a little different than just a mere sermon recap, I'm, I'm sort of trying to dig a little deeper, because there's now two worlds are emerging, okay, you have the preaching world that I'm in, and I have now the daily vlog that I'm doing, so it's kind of like I want to, I can't help but kind of combine them together from time to time, and I can't do that when I'm preaching, because not everybody that sees me preach sees the, the vlog, so... This is a chance here to just kind of expand my thoughts a little. Okay, enough of that. Now, you may be thinking, why is it that you take this area of prescription and sort of cut the debate off at the pass rather than engaging in further debate? And I think it's just because I've just spent so much time on this topic. That That's one reason why I feel just... Like, I don't feel like the rest of the debate's worth having. And in fact, when Peter Singer just started about, talking about animal rights, I just, I knew all I was hearing was an opinion. And the guy, the scholar he was debating for a long time, after a while, finally just said, look, you kept using the word ought. And you just have no reason to have an ought. And I was like, why are we getting to this now? I mean, like, I don't, well, we're getting into it now because, you know, otherwise you don't have a debate. Okay. So I'm going to introduce two ideas here. The one idea is sometimes there's enough in a subject to be able to talk about it very broadly and to debate certain elements and discuss elements of it. But when it comes to ethics, remember I said this, that it's a prescriptive enterprise. And what I mean by that is unless you solve the ought issue, what they call the is-ought issue, you can't do any more ethics. They can't be done. This is known as an epistemic chain. The strength of the chain is only as good as its weakest link. In the link. And in this case, um, prescription, the chain's broken if you don't have prescription. This leads me to my Romans 1 uh, today. And the reason why is because Paul speaks with the authority of an apostle, right? Apostolic authority. This is to say that he... God has given him a certain degree of authority, as I've mentioned on this channel many times, to speak with his authority. And as a result, he has prescription because God is competent. Okay? He's omniscient. He judges sin, but he acts out wrath on the sin, and he has the power to act out his wrath. In preaching today, it was nice to know not for any personal reasons at all. Don't misunderstand me. It was just nice to be able to speak from the scriptures and know that there's actual prescription that God can say, this is what you ought to do. And it actually means something as opposed to, well, it's a really smart guy's opinion, which amounts to nothing. Okay, so this is really important that this is understood. So Paul in chapter 2. Now, last week I mentioned that I was going to discuss, discuss a little bit of an issue with whether he's talking to man in general or to Jews. I now believe that he's talking to Jews. Reading some commentaries on it, I think it's actually pretty clear. And here's why. Paul has a phantom opponent in this passage. That is classic Paul. Up to this point, I've mentioned before, he has had many debates with Jews that have a problem with the gospel. And I believe that what this is, this is an amalgamation of multiple conversations Paul has probably had, objections he's seen. And so um, as I go through this, I'm going to talk about a couple of these things. 
Um, but we cannot do this without the zany professor. Now I should tell you that the zany professor, just to get give you, so you can get to know him a little better. I found out that the zany professor's stepmother's ex 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 boyfriend's cousin. I think that's right. Yes. Prefers Coke products over Pepsi products. All right. That's cleared up now. Chapter 2 of Romans, starting in verse 1. Ready? Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. Now, what this appears to be like, every one of you who judges, appears like on the heels of him talking, if you read the end of chapter 1 here, he's going into sin that everyone has. And so it appears that he's now used all that to talk about judgment. But that's not what's happening here. Okay, What's happening here is he's saying to the Jews, you may think because you have the law that, and this is the main point of this passage that needs to be understood. That's why it's good I cleared it up. You may think because you have the law that you're good, that you've got it all taken care of. So he's just now addressed the Gentiles, but he's looking at the Jews now and he's thinking back to these opponents he's had. And he's going, guess what? You don't have it all together. So think about that as I read this. Therefore you have no excuse, O oh man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. And in that list of sins, everyone, Jewish or Gentile, can find themselves in some of that. We know that the judgment of God, rightly, now who's we, right? He's talking about himself. He's Jewish, right? Talking to our Jews. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who do such things. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who do such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or, you to, or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? Verse 4 of chapter 2. Are you familiar with the Old Testament? Because if you're familiar with the Old Testament, this makes a whole lot of sense. Let me reread it. Think about this. Think about how God was patient. Think about the prophets that had a problem with this. Right? We've got some prophets in mind. Jonah, right? Jonah had a big problem. Listen to what Paul says in 4. Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? They finally got it, right? Nineveh, I believe? They got it. Just, it's that biblical pattern. As a side note, Anyone who tells you that the Old Testament is not the God of the New Testament needs to get a clue. That's ridiculous. And there are people who are preachers for years that never figured this one out. Anyway, but because of your hard and impenitent, impenitent heart, you are stor storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. So rather than understanding God's patience and that leading to repentance, because they refuse to repent, they are actually doing something that's even worse. They're storing up wrath for themselves. And that's troubling. He will render to each one according to his works. So this is for, now again, you'll see that I'm right. Not that I'm right, Paul's right, but you'll see that I'm right in my interpretation. That what we're about to read, Paul is summing this up and saying, this is for you to understand in full. That it's for everyone not just Jew, Gentiles, Jews and Gentiles. He will render to each one according to his work, each one, to those who by uh, patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil the Jew first and also the Greek, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. For God shows no partiality. 
very much in keeping with uh, Paul's teaching that God shows no partiality. Now for next week, I just want to read uh, this first part in 12, but we'll recover it next week. For all who have sinned without the law will perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. So there's going to be, obviously, when you get to that part, you go, well, that's a whole nother can of worms. It is a whole nother can of worms, and yet it links very clearly with um, what we've just read, too. So a lot to consider there, um, a lot to think about. I'll just say this. If you read Jesus' teachings in Matthew in particular, where he's talking about hypocrisy, and he's saying, don't be like these hypocrites who pray loudly so everyone can hear them fits right into with what, what Paul is saying here, okay? Paul's teaching is right in line with Jesus' teaching on this. It's right in line with Old Testament teaching on it, okay? And um, pretty amazing stuff. 